and we are live okay so uh we are here today to finish off part three of jacques ranciere's hatred of democracy now i didn't get to attend this meeting but uh uh you sent me the did you send me the uh the yes file? uh through the um live private chat i can send okay. it through the live comments if you want uh did you send it on Facebook? Uh, no, through this Steam Yard. Oh, I, I don't see anything there. Okay, I'll send it through Facebook. Okay. Or if you go to my website, it's number 246. Okay, well, either way, you can... Um, I don't really need to see it. You can okay. just take us, take us through the book. Right, okay. So where are we at? So we're in the third and the last chapter. There's uh, four chapters, and we've done the first three. And just briefly on the first three, he's detected a new hatred of democracy that's directed at the people when they express their democratic desires outside of an election time. So it's not directed necessarily at the at the institutions, such as actually voting or at elections or at the idea of majority rule. It is directed though at people who want to change the system or things within the system outside of elections. Um, and the reason that he says that this is happening is because all governments in all times in all places in history have always been oligarchic. That is that they are run by elites who claim a certain title to rule. Often those titles are in the past have been as a result of strength. Nowadays, it's more in terms of credentials or wealth or status. All of these are foisted upon us as reasons why some people are better or should rule over those who are who don't have whatever title these people may claim are, are the right way or the best way to rule. Democracy opposes this by saying that it doesn't matter. Your titles are not the reason. There is no reason why anybody should ever rule over anybody else. It's always contingent. It's always completely, um, I hate to use arbitrary, but it's it's based on chance. And uh, in the very beginning of the book, he was talking about how um, if you want the job, you're not qualified. Right. right. However, um, he recognizes that that's an ideal situation that uh, doesn't really work in the real world won't wouldn't work in this real world that we live in today uh and so that's what, oh yeah uh yes and that's essentially where we got to now in today's last chapter which he entitles the rationality of the hatred he's um he's going to go over some of the techniques and tools that uh, they use as well as some of the options that we have in the real world to make it in a sense better he starts off by claiming that uh demo that the the people who support this new hatred of democracy, which are always the elites, the oligarchs of government and of wealth, um, they want to attribute the limitlessness of wealth or the desire for the limitlessness of wealth, that is of capitalism and its voracious appetites to the democratic will of the people. You see, it's a bait and switch in a sense. Mm -hmm. They, the where corporations, pardon? The freedom to get rich. Is, yes. Is well, different. they want to hide that and blame its excesses and its follies and its uh, and its its problems on the will of the people. So, if it's uh, the argument, sort of goes like this: we can't let the um, we can't let people have uh, the de their democratic rights all the time or their democratic will expressed all the time because then they would take everything from us. And where would we be? I mean, where would the job makers be or the job creators, right. as an example? So they want to say, if we were to give free reign to democracy, the world would come to an end. And there's a certain a set of cultural uh, and uh, political tactics that are used, and we're going to cover at least three of them in the next little, and then before the end of this, that are used to scare, in a sense, people away from democracy. And this is happening right now with Bernie Saunders or Sanders. Uh, people That's are what saying. I was going to bring up. Yeah. Well, gonna, go ahead. Um, yeah, like with him winning now, if he doesn't get a plur, uh, a majority of votes for the convention, they'll try to uh, use their super delegate super delegates to uh, to um, keep him to out. Yeah, keep him out basically. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some other long-term Democrats I heard were saying something like, oh, if it's a choice between Bernie or Trump, I might run for Trump. These are exactly <laughs> these are some of the these are examples of some of the fears that are being used. They're afraid of democracy. Yes, because he is probably the most democratic candidate out there. Uh, he's like literally a social democrat or democratic socialist or whatever. Yeah, he says democratic socialist, right? Uh, and socialism is considered a bad word in the United States. So uh, he's incredibly brave in that sense of standing it up to it. Now, uh, for all the other things that uh, may be wrong with Bernie Saunders, he's the best choice that Americans Man. have. Sanders, Saunders. I keep thinking of Colonel Saunders. <laughs> Colonel, Colonel Sanders? Is it Sanders there too? Okay, whatever. Chicken. Yeah. Anyway. Um, in case there's any doubt, I am about as unconditionally supportive of uh, Bernie Sanders uh, as of any other possible candidate out there. Conditionally. Uh, it's <laughs> considering the rest of them. Um, <laughs> there's very little he could do that just would distract me or would uh, change my vote for him if he's the only choice or if he's the other choices, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that they uh, that uh, this new hatred of democracy have done is they've. Um, in a sense, they've corrupted the, the natural idea or the original ideas that are associated with democracy. So, for example, elections um, or voting. Voting often is considered to be, uh, you need unanimous consent before it's considered valid. So a superior power that demands um, a, a vote from those whom, it, whom support it, if it doesn't get that superior power, it's a major... Uh, it's a major faux pas for them. It's supposed to be that way. Uh, so the idea of first past the post or voting in our system of representation, which nobody ever gets that, it's already going against the initial set of conditions that were meant with the vote. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, North Korea, which gets pretty much everything else wrong, does get this correct. So although their candidates are not really chosen or free or anything like that, they need to get 95% popular support or they're replaced. Wow. And that just means that they actually do have the consent of the people. And if they don't get that 95% of the of the vote, the party finds somebody else to replace them. So they got everything else wrong. <laughs> okay. So don't get, don't, don't suggest I'm thinking about North Korea is great, but they got this notion of the vote better than we do. 95. Now that's something like, to hear that in a in our you know liberal capitalist democracies, that's that sounds almost unbelievable. Fantastic. It does. It does. Well, because we live in a world that's corrupted that uh, with corrupted democracy from his perspective. Again, mm -hmm. when you're coming to okay, his def, one of his definitions is coming together in equality for the common good. The common good is much more easily identified if you don't have private interests involved. So any politicians being paid. It's already corrupted. They have an invested interest in get, keeping their paycheck. If they get any status symbols out as a result of becoming elected, that's a personal private interest, right? If yeah. they have any special privileges, if they can get reelected, this introduces a whole set of private um, interests. You take what those out and then the common good becomes much easier to see. So we've already, we already live in a corrupted system, but assuming you could get that, Your um, your your audio just cut out. That last sentence you just said, I didn't hear anything. Still don't hear you. Can you hear me? So you can hear me. I can't hear a word of your of what you're saying. Um. No, it sounds like your audio is that. Oh, no, it sounds like your audio is, should be working. What is going on? <clears throat> Hold on a second. No, it's working on my end. So here, maybe try leaving and coming back here. I'll, I'll kick you out. <laughs> Sorry about that gang. Um,
try to invite him back in. Um, can you hear me? I still can't hear you. So it's, it's your something with your microphone must not be picking up. What could have? Still nothing. You know what? Maybe go back to your your computer microphone. That might be our only option. Still don't hear anything. Still don't hear anything. Maybe you, res it's, you might have to reset your computer. I don't know. <clears throat> Oops. I can edit this later, right? Okay, give me a minute. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. The mic says it says it's working. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So, uh, <laughs> your memory where you left off? Um, we were talking about North Korea. Uh, yeah. So they've they've essentially got uh, the voting idea correct. Um, it's hard to say they have anything else right, but that that part they do, and probably better than we do. So the the new modern hatred of democracy wants to uh, tribute to the to, de to the democratic principle everything that is wrong with capitalism and so in a sense bait and switch mm. the problems in the world that are caused by capitalism and attribute them to democracy. democracy exactly and that is that's that's the essential motivation so he sees that there's a, a coalition between the oligarchs of wealth and the oligarchs of the state or of the elites of the uh, country uh to do what they wish and any time that people stand up and say, no, we don't really want that or we want you to change that, it's a problem for them because it stops what, they, what they're doing. I have a, a great example, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Today was watching some discussion between um, uh, some random right-wing idiot and, uh, and a popular left uh, 
leftist uh, streamer, uh -huh. and uh, the 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 uh, the right winger was trying to say that um, single parent families and poverty um, are correlated with the beginning of the welfare state, so that it was welfare programs that caused are causing single parent, uh, you know, black families and uh, uh, and the the poor, um, their the poor culture that they have apparently. Right. Not uh, capitalism. No, not capitalism. Not, not white supremacy. Not at all. Not, not by, the effects of slavery. By that logic, we should get rid of hospitals because there's been nothing but sick people there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's 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 amazing backwards kind of rationalization. Exactly. Oh, man. Okay, so according to uh, Ranchier, the worst form of government is uh, is a government of those who are skilled at seizing power, who love and are good at seizing power. So he feels that even in our corrupted rep representative system that we live in, there are at least five things that we should do within this corrupted system to mitigate that worst form of government. Uh, it does, it's not a perfect system because already representation from his perspective is not uh, ideal, but it is the world we live in. So he recommends that um, any representative system should have short and non-renewable electoral mandates that cannot be held concurrently. So we at least got that non-concurrently part proper, okay. but uh, they should be short and non-renewable. So in my case, I have a four-year term. I suspect that he would suggest it should be at the most of one year, probably six months. He doesn't say that in the book, but I'm just uh, speculating here based on what he said. Second thing, and this, this goes directly to uh, something I often hear, it, it takes a while for new democratic elected people, new people in, to get up to speed and to learn the ropes yeah. to say. Yeah, so he says that's the process of becoming an oligarch. Uh, so if so, you if you are starting to make excuses for the state, you've been lost. So the second thing that he recommends is a monopoly of people's representatives over the formulation of laws. So that, yes, the idea is that if you have to learn the ropes, you're becoming an oligarch. So you demand things and you write the laws yourself such that they get done. Because then if you start to listen to established interests, uh, people with um, vested private interests, you're getting away from the common good or the common benefits. Well, well, hold on. Now, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't you argue that um, the reason you'd want so, uh, people with experience in, uh, in leadership is that uh, the established outside interests, the established moneyed interests, uh, would be able to more easily trick and sway uh, newbies because uh, the, the newbies wouldn't wouldn't be used to their their uh, their games. Right, they're used to their games. But what he's arguing is that getting used to it is the bad process. When you come on and you say, but you know how to counter it if you're, I don't know. If you're if you're experienced, no. I my experience is that the more experienced you are, the uh, the more corrupt. likely you're to <laughs> yes. <laughs> and from his perspective, the longer you're in there, the more corrupt, because you start to listen to these people who say you can't do that, and you say yes, I can. I have a monopoly of the formation of laws, so let me write it in. Hmm. So yeah, um, the longer you're in power, the more you know the game. That game is already corrupted. There shouldn't necessarily be a game because you're already you're supposed to be coming there in equality for the common good. If you have to learn a game, you're learning how to play interests off each other. Mm. So he said, uh, and this so is you're part not of doing the, democracy anymore. Precisely, you're doing oligarchic uh, fighting, inter-oligarchic fighting, which is in fact what he claims is happening all over the world right now, and especially in the United States where you have two established parties and they just keep switching power between the two of them every couple of years or every four or eight years. Yeah. Uh, and he refers to these parties as the governing or government parties because right. they are in 
support of the oligarchic system. So when you have a new guy coming in, he has an idea, presents it to the other people who are elected for a very short time, and uh, it, if, if it's convincible that it's in the common good because he doesn't have any private interests involved, that gets done. It's very quick. So one of the things that people are complain um, are very uh, are saying with great pride in China's ability to contain this uh, novo uh, novo coronavirus uh, because they are a dictatorship and they can get like hospitals built in three days that kind of stuff. Well, that's equally possible in a democracy, but maybe not our democracy where there's so many vested interests. When it becomes an issue of the common good, and the representatives actually have the ability to write the laws right there and then you can get the same kind of turnaround that you would get uh, in a dictatorship without mm -hmm. the dictatorship possibilities. Mm -hmm. So that's why his second thing is you got to be able to write the laws right away. And uh, if you don't, if you don't, and the second you start playing a game, you're already corrupted. You got to be able to write the laws right away. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the third thing he says, so he gives five things that we can do to make our representative system avoid the worst of all forms of government, is a ban on state functionaries becoming the representatives of the people. Now, he's French, uh, so this doesn't strike me as a very bad thing. Uh, maybe they don't do this in France, I don't know. But here in Canada, in the city level, if you work for the city, you can't run for city council or elected office. You actually have to take a leave of absence or quit your job. So sounds like we're getting that part right anyway. At least in the city. In the city, yes. Um, the fourth thing he says is a bare minimum of campaigning and campaign costs. Again, ideally, you shouldn't have any campaigns because people are sort of uh, picked by lottery. But uh, given that we're living in a representative system, the bigger the campaign, the worse it is. And the longer. And the longer, yeah. If you're if you're campaigning for a year and a half like they do in the United States, yeah, yeah there, there's a big problem there. Insane. Insane. Exactly. Exactly. So he would say, yeah, money should not be involved in this at all. And the bare, bare minimums, maybe, I mean, I think he might be okay with it. One of the things we have in the city is a, one, a refundable $100 uh, cost to register as a, as a candidate. I, yeah. that's, and because it's refundable, it, it's in theory possible for anybody. And if you have a very short election cycle, um, it's, it's not inconceivable that even the poorest person can do this uh, on credit and get it back. But in reality... Uh, it costs a couple thousand dollars to get elected in the city. Yeah, yeah. Because you got, I mean, you got to have signs, you got to have a team, you got to pay for, know. yeah, you got, there's a lot of things you got to pay for. Materials. Right. So he's suggesting all that has to go or be at the bare minimums. Or, or be funded by the government somehow, maybe? Uh, he doesn't mention that, but. In that sense that the government say, okay, you can spend $1,000 and that's it and we pay for it uh, or you can pay for it or whatever, but it has to be clear. Um, I suspect that one of the things he's hoping for is, uh, is that people don't go beyond the limits and hide it. So you hear about this happening with the conservatives here in Canada and not much is happening, right? They, they spent more in you know, sideways spending in such a ways that uh, they didn't, uh, they, they exceeded their campaign allowances. Um, yeah, that kind of stuff would be forbidden or preventable or prevented and should be. And the fifth thing he says is the monitoring of possible interference by economic powers in the electoral process. So super PACs, he'd be very much against that. Uh, third party advertisers. Yeah, you shouldn't have any of that kind of stuff. So again, these don't make a good democracy but these are meant to stop the worst form of government, which he quote, and he says, the government of those who love power and are skilled at seizing it. And he continues on, in a word, the monopolizing of public affairs by a solid alliance of state oligarchs and economic oligarchy. That, according to him, is the worst form of all government. And although we don't live, we can't, with representative government, we can't make it perfect, we can certainly make it a lot better. Does that okay. make sense? Right. Mm -hmm. So he's he's saying bef while while we're here before the revolution, these are the steps we can take in order to keep from the worst kind of oligarchy or fascism from from yes. uh, appearing. Yes. So then he gives uh, three examples of uh, some of the techniques that are used uh, by oligarchs or the elites to govern over the people. 
And uh, the first one he labels as majoritarianism. And as he was describing, I was thinking, this is very close to what the situation is like in Canada. The notion of majoritarianism for him is a system that eliminates parties on the fringes or extremes. In other words, uh, no good or bad parties on the extremes. And gives power to alternating strongest minority government parties. Minority government. Right, right. <laughs> yes. Because, because the conservatives and, and liberals in Canada never win more than 50% of the vote. That's right. So alternating strongest minority governments. So it's probably the case that the governing the governing body or the governing government has more votes than the next party but they're still a minority <laughs> and then they rule without serious opposition for a number of years so yeah. the all that the, the, the any opposition can do in a in a majority in what we call a major, major majoritarian government is to maybe slow down and perhaps try and embarrass the government um, right. but that's it and yeah, that's that that's the sum that's the system that we have right now and now there's a big evil in this from his perspective it it it's essentially giving us two false choices that we can do uh, we always have to vote we're always choosing one of the two government parties um, but the only expression of democratic, it's, a, it's an expression of democratic resignation when we have no real choice, when our only actionable choice, when they're fake choices, are to um, strategic vote or to vote for the least worst option. So these are two common, common um, laments that people have about our system. I'm not voting for, there's nobody here who I would vote for, so I'm voting for the person who I think is the least worst. So, I mean, you could even say that about Bernie Sanders. Yes, you could. Because, uh, you know, he's he's not um, he's not a real socialist. He's a social democrat. Yeah. So, I mean, so he's much, 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 much better than everyone else. But he's still <laughs> not, you know, he's not he's not my ideal. Right. Candidate. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Your ideal candidate doesn't exist. They're just not there. They're for, they're forbidden. Right. In a sense. He's not he's not me then. <laughs> That's another way to say it. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah. So, um, yeah. So when you have when you're when you're left with resignation that you have to vote strategically or vote for the least worst option, like or you don't want this other person getting in, but you don't like the liberals either, so you vote for liberals because you don't want the conservatives to get in, but you're really NDP, for example, or you're really green, or you're really an anarchist. Um, that's <laughs> yeah. that's the that's all that we have in a corrupted system, and he sees this as lamentable, very lamentable. Indeed. And one other thing he points out about our system is that um, we like to make fun of our politicians. And he thinks this is also a, a function of uh, people being sort of frustrated with having no choice or having a choice between pretty much identical government parties. Um, making fun of your elected officials um, in, his, in an ideal world is like making fun of jury duty or people who succumb to jury duty or people who do their duty. Um, it's, it's not really something that is appropriate for people who are giving of themselves for the common good, right. but it is okay in our system because nobody's actually doing it for the common good. Everybody has an agenda. So he sees that as a, a as a type of protest by people who feel that they don't have anything they they can't really express themselves. So in his, go ahead. So us mocking our politicians. Yes, that is a symptom of a corrupt form. Um, if you were ever to cor to make fun of jurors in a jury system, you would have a corrupt jury system, right? right. But it, as long as it like you start laughing at somebody who's making who's a juror, look at them sitting there or something like that, or look how they look or something like that. That's very inappropriate because you realize that they're sacrificing of themselves to do that. That's what politicians should be like, but they can't be in our system. Be like that... making fun of firefighters. Yeah. Oh, look, they're running into a fire. Yeah. How stupid is that? No, <laughs> like that. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's actually a better example, in my opinion. Um, 
making fun of firefighters is totally inappropriate because they're giving of themselves. The same should be for politicians. But in our world, that's not going to happen. I mean, it's 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 a symbol. Uh, it's a symptom of uh, distress in the democracy that people laugh at their politicians. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I mean, it's world. It's a worldwide phenomenon. I don't know anywhere that that, that isn't true. But hey, you know what? Maybe in uh, Rojava. Maybe Java. They, they probably, uh, yeah, the um, the Kurdish, uh, what the hell are they called? Uh, Kurdish, uh, um, they have a, a pseudo anarchist, um, stateless kind of uh, organization there. Oh, um, uh, so it's like a fighting force and their and form of government. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, not familiar with that. Yeah, um, well, they might be the only ones. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Okay, so there's another term that's out there that's often used uh, quite negatively. It's the term populism. Yep. Ideally, you would think that if you're listening to the will of the people, uh, the popular will of the people, you should be doing what they want. Uh, but it's negatively. It's uh, it's associated with uh, the weirdest oh, of yeah. things, right? So you have yes. populist people who are demanding this or that, and you say, well, they're ignorant. They're, there's something wrong with them. They don't understand. And this is where democracy as a principle um, challenges directly or is, is trying to challenge directly all those people who govern by the authority of credentials or by knowledge. Um, when you have, uh, say, whoever it is claiming that they have the knowledge and this is the way things are done, independent of what the, the democratic will of the people is, you have these two would clash. So you have experts saying this is how things should be done, and you have democratic elected people who would say, nope, we're going to change the laws right away. Um, that This is the... In order to stop that democratic will from appear, appearing, you label them as populists. Right. You say, oh, you can't do that. That's just like too much democracy. You're, or you're doing it at the wrong time. Or that'll never fly. Or something right. like that. Because we're experts. And it's we know. pejorative. Exactly. Now, they make sure it's a pejorative because they associate it with as many um, crazy ideas as possible in a sense. Crazy in the sense that uh, lunatic fringe kind of stuff. Not right. as in real, honest to goodness things that could actually work. Um, so people who might want to put a tinfoil on their heads and say we're protecting ourselves from alien invasion, that kind of stuff, versus people who might say in the past um, a basic income would be good for everybody, <laughs> that kind of stuff. Populism is, is generally associated with uh, a movement kind of against the elites. Yes, the exactly. And, and it, you know, you can only have populism in a society with an elite um, where there isn't democracy. So that by definition is going to be populism. Yes. Now, here's the interesting thing. Populism by itself can, uh, can, is a pretty powerful force. In a certain way, Trump got elected on the idea of standing up to the elites, draining the swamp. Draining it was... The <laughs> well, uh, he probably just repopulated with his own people. He did. Uh, First but, people, actually. Yes, in that case. Um, so that's a, that, that, I'm sure, in the future will be described as what happens when you give in to populism uh, of the yeah. worst kind. Right. But the impetus behind... Your mic's gone again. Can't hear you. Oh no. Oh no. Well, whatever you did to fix it, you're going to have to do again, I think. Shoot. Well, <clears throat> if anyone's in chat, I don't think anyone is in chat. Ask me some questions. Or what do you want me to talk about? <clears throat> Tell you about my weekend. Went to a birthday party downtown. Went to the dirtiest of dirty nightclubs in town. Some of the greatest characters uh, you'll ever see in a bar. It's fun stuff. Let's have a look, see here. 
view on YouTube. There's three, there's three people watching now. Go ahead, ask a question. Let's kill the time here while, uh, oh, there we go. Jeff's back. Never mind. Okay. Is everything working now? Yeah, everything's good. Okay. Let's finish off. Okay. I'm just, uh, finding my notes here. Okay. So that was populism. Uh, what's the other one? Let's see here. Okay, yeah, these uh, it's two opposing uh, systems of legitimation that uh, essentially are fighting each other. And it's, again, the oligarchic alliance of wealth and science that are claiming power over the people because they know better. And this is, this is in fact, not very democratic. Um, so populism is another one. Uh, globalization is the third example. Well, it's the third example that I deal with. Um, he sees a globalization at its inception as an act of faith, or not as an act of faith, as a word of faith. And he defines it in particular as, here's the faith that you have to have in that the free circulation of capital demanding an ever more rapid profitability is a providential law that shall lead humanity to a better future. This, according to him, is the myth the faith that is promulgated anytime the term globalization is being used positively we want more globalization because more profitability for the higher ups of course will lead to a better future for all trickle down <laughs> exactly that's another example of yes that would so, be <laughs> so this is a he's saying this is a religious belief basically it is in fact he claims it fits all the criteria for a religious belief we as consumers adhere to this and we are constantly being asked to give outward signs of our devotion at every christmas at halloween at easter when we buy easter eggs and halloween candy at mother's day when we buy mother's day cards and gifts for people at birthday parties these things are all in a sense being commercialized and we're expected to give outward signs of our devotion black friday these are these are more and more examples of this. And if you disagree with this, you're labeled as ignorant. Like, what's wrong with you? Why do you still have a flip phone when you can get a smartphone? That kind of stuff, right? Um, why don't you? <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's like uh, a snide remark saying, come on, show them better faith. Um, get the latest uh, smart gadget. Get the latest um, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade all the time. That kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> it, it, this, this, is, this lack of faith that people might have in this is derog is expressed derogatorily. People uh, like are mirroring religion. Exactly, and in a fa in a sense, you're always you're ostracized. You're excommunicated, not ostracized. Thank you. Yes. So, for example, if you're not wearing clean clothing <laughs> and the latest fashions, you're not going to get into the best restaurants, kind of stuff. Or people are not going to take you seriously when you try. And that's an example similar to religion if you don't show enough piety and devotion to a religion you're not taken seriously in that faith right right you're just a pretender yeah, exactly so these are examples of the use of language that is used to confuse and to move people away from what democracy really is and blame it for all the evils of capitalism yeah okay so yeah that's a very common theme with conservatives Right wingers yes. is is everything that is capitalism's fault they blame on something else or the poor or or socialism or democ democracy basically and, and in particular democracy yes particular, so yeah. that and that's his claim uh the reason we don't have a really good state of democracy is precisely because it's being vilified so much now he wants to get uh much closer into the exact definition of democracy so it's not a form of government like we think it is that's a misnomer like we live in a democratic state, we're told, right? Even North Korea claims to be a democratic state and so does China and Singapore, okay? Um, no, it's not true. Um, we've already corrupted that. For him, democracy is not a form of government and that, that's a major problem that uh, people have been taught incorrectly. It is the challenging, any challenging of the elites and of the oligarchic order is a democratic struggle. And anytime you win, you put the oligarchy or the um, the elites on, you check their power, you have gotten a democratic victory. But it's always a, a continuous struggle because they continue to try and erode it and to get it away. This 
is why democracy is as old as human civilization or as human society is. It's always been there and it's absolutely always necessary. The, the idea that he says is that when science, the principle of democratic rule, meaning the struggle of the will of the people and the principle that those who know best should rule or those who with most power should rule are right, basically equal, then you have a good functioning, not perfect in the sense of the rules and laws are not perfect, but you have a functioning state. You have a good state of affairs. When one dominates, in particular the oligarchic or the, 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 um, the oligarchs of power or the oligarchs of state or the oligarchs of uh, knowledge or any of those people who have a title to rule, dominate over the rest, you have a major corruption of democracy. And that's when democracy becomes even more important to fight against, or sorry, fight for, with. <laughs> Yeah. So we live in a world in which experts essentially rule. And occasionally they're checked. Like we do have democracy in Canada. He, he, well, he says experts. Yes. Experts because they claim they know what they're talking about. <clears throat> in that sense, um, there's experts everywhere. And it's not bad that we have experts. He doesn't want to discourage experts. He doesn't want to like take them out and have them shot or anything like that. They're absolutely necessary when kept in their place subservient to the democratic will of the people. But the natural inclination of those who know is to increase their power relative to those who rule by no other virtue than that they were elected. Isn't there a, 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 a word for rule by experts? No. Uh, meritocracy or something like that, maybe? Technocracy, no. Or, I, th I thought like Plato or Aristotle or someone someone talked about this. That the, Probably, that, I like, don't oh, know. Like rule, rule by by the by wise people, wise guys, philosophers. Uh, maybe, that's not, maybe that's something different. <laughs> well, he does suggest that philosophers should be kings and kings should become philosophers. <laughs> that was Plato, but you know, uh, I I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, I'm thinking of something different. Um, but no, I would say we're not so much ruled by experts as we are by by people with power, usually bourgeois capitalists. Um, yes. So that he talks about the link between those two and their, their alliance, but it's the experts that justify it. So one of the things that he points ah, out yeah. about experts is that experts will follow the direct, or in a sense, follow direction. If they get direction from people who are, in a sense, corrupted with personal interests, they will be used in the worst possible way. However, if these experts are being used, in a sense, by the democratic will of the people, they will do things differently. And as examples of this, um, there are, there's, okay, let's put it this way. There's, there's a good and right scientific way to put up a statue, build a road, uh, build a building. But the, the value that goes with whether you build that statue, that building or that road, that's the democratic decision. And insofar as experts are succumbing to, or not succumbing, sorry, I should say, are under the uh, power of the democratic people, elected people, or represent, not represent, I hate to use representative because he hates it, um, the elect, uh, the democratic forces, then they are doing a good job. But if they're under the, uh, if they're serving the elite interests of the, of the um, capitalist class, they're also doing a good job from their perspective, but it's against democratic will. So they're enriching mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the elites. So what he's saying is that the experts are absolutely necessary, but by virtue of what, of whom they are working for is the issue. And in that sense, right. that's where democratic struggle needs to come up and be constantly on guard for the elites overcoming them. So these experts become experts at justifying the uh, oligarchic structure. Yes. And, Often uh, because it's better for them yes. uh, because they get paid a lot. So there was a common... Um, there was a, somebody was pointing out that uh, Fox News is made up of uh, millionaire newscasters who are working for billionaires to keep them billionaires, right? Uh, that's the, that in a sense has been, Fox News has been co-opted, corrupted in a sense, by the power elite against the democratic will. That's, that's what he would say in this particular case. Uh, probably the same for all major news networks. If you're a major yeah. news network, I mean, you're owned by somebody who's extremely well off. Um, and that's that's part of the problem. There's money in that one. And you're serving their interests. Yes. 
because they pay your paycheck. That's, or they enhance your paycheck or they, they give you extra status. There's a whole bit of different ways of doing this. And experts in a sense need to be uh, reminded of their place to serve the democratic will of the people. Because if you're asking for a better world, you can come together in equality to find what the common good is, or you can take, in, as it is in the world today, the advice of people who have a vested interest. And you know, I'm a job creator, so lower my taxes so I can create more jobs. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the game. That's the game. So from his perspective, democracy is always at struggle of government of anybody and everybody that checks the power of the elites or of wealth or of anybody who has a title and uses that as a reason to rule. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think so too. And that's basically it. So what he's suggesting is um, be aware, learn what democracy really means. What you've been taught in your history books is not the case. <laughs> that's a corruption already trying to distract you from the truth. Um, right. Anytime you struggle against um, established interests, you are, and if you win, you're improving the, democ the democracy of that country. So there is in fact, from his definition, there's democracy in Canada, it's not perfect, and it's not in the system. There's also democracy in North Korea. Even the most totalitarian states, in a sense, have to be democratic. But they've all corrupted the notions that go with democracy, some more so than others. Oh, yeah, yeah, de well, definitely. All right, well, sounds like a good book, Jacques. Rancière. Uh, Rossier, yeah, okay. So uh, next up we have Antonio Negri, uh, his book Art and Multitude, in which he's um, giving his take on art theory or touch of with a touch of art history. Um, and uh, he's a communist, uh, Italian. Um, he was um, was in exile for quite a while. Uh, this is a set of uh, nine essay, nine letters he wrote to friends, but I don't know if they're real friends. I think he may have. <laughs> just made them up for the sake of this uh, this book. Um, they were apparently published over several Big friends. decades and uh, put together. And uh, they, they deal with perhaps a new way to look at how to organize art. And how to think about art, right? Exactly. And how to think about art is actually, yeah, yes, no, exactly. Agree. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, we'll offline, we'll, we'll figure out uh, a, a date and a time to, uh, to do that one. Sounds good. Other than that, thanks for coming on, Jeff, and we'll see you My next pleasure. time. My pleasure. All right. I look forward to it. Thank you. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye.